good evening everyone good evening everyone uh, thank you for joining academy of theology is um an institution that seek to contextualize christianity in african context and we want to bring the gospel and apply them in the context of african as we believe that the gospel is contextualized and it's um and it's written that form so we have formed this as part of uh, first corinthians chapter 9 from um, verse um, 19 to 22 where paul said i have been to the jews i became a jews in order to win them and to the others to be in order to win them so academy of theology seek to address issues pertaining to the gospel and bring the gospel alive we don't change the gospel but we bring in the context of our people especially africans uh to to, to highlight those points that are there and also we will be starting our school officially officially in 2024 and the school will be in pretoria and with all the subjects that are necessary that we will be addressing and also what we seek to do is to help pastors who are ministering in the township and ministering in the rural area to be context to be con contextualizing the gospel in those areas to know how to minister in the township what are the requirement to minister in the township and also to minister in the rural area we are there as a uh, institution try to fill the gap that we so in need in doing that that we need to have such school that will address such, such issues not more of academic academia but more on practical side of um of the gospel and in our people in a manner that will be highlighted so easily so welcome to this webinar this is a third webinar this year that we have and we have our page facebook we have our page youtube where all our um, webinar are being recorded some of those we will use in our school as some reference to our studies like this one we're going to use it so that we address issues that um we we're, we're, we're faced by our people without any waste of time i will hand over to Sbu to introduce the speaker and also to introduce the subject and so that we will have more time so that at the end of the day you'll have questions and after that we will close our um, webinar today and welcome all of you uh, who first time to come to the Academy of Theology webinar and we, we, uh, we like you to stay over and listen to what Dr. Uh, Rissane will address us and also the question you have. Thank you. Over to you, Sbu. Thank you. Thank you, Bafana. Um, thank you for that. Um, let me let me introduce the topic in a different in a different way. I am going to introduce it by actually reading from Dr. Torresani's book, um, a portion of what he wrote, which I thought was very profound, under the topic "Why Some Africans Reject the God of the Bible." Why some Africans reject the God of the Bible. This is what Dr. Resani said in this book that he wrote as South African experiences. Africans struggle, and I quote, Africans struggle with the uninvolved God. For them, God should be part and parcel of their struggles as a champion who fights with them to emerge as victors. The God who is Emmanuel must literally dwell amongst his people as both the protector Jehovah Nissi and the provider Jehovah Jireh. For African Christians, the word Logos, who is alive and dwells, tabernacles, tents amongst his people, is both immanent and transcendent. Like a tent, he is both above and among his people. The crisis of conscience arises when God distances himself from his creation, especially humanities and its affairs. If this God fails, he receives rejection and is deemed passive and uninvolved. African sufferings and miseries are the cause of the distance, a gulf between God and his people. These miseries are the root of reverting to ethnic religions that are couched in traditional religions involving 
ancestral venerations. What adds to the wound, and this is the part that is critical, what adds salt to the wound is that the missionary gospel or the Western Christianity has offered itself on the trail of unjust practices that do not solve these miseries, but enhance the rejection of this God. Why some Africans reject God in the Bible. So what we are discussing here tonight is not just some academic topic just to tickle our fancy, not just something that was written as an interesting topic. Um, this is a very, very important topic, I believe, in this season that we are in as Africa, as South Africa. It is very much important for us to, to be able to be uh, acclaimed with um, knowing our context and knowing our history if we are going to fulfill the Great Commission, if we are going to be good missionaries, if we are going to be people that are going to proclaim the gospel faithfully and authentically, it's very important that we understand the history that we come from. And it is my privilege, it is my honor to have Dr. Uh, Thomas Resane to come and address us on this topic, to help us as uh, Africans, particularly South Africans, to have a better understanding of our history, to, to be able to reflect as well on the stuff that has gone on before on how the gospel was brought to us and how we can learn from the past so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the future. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Risane formally now, uh, and then I'm going to hand over to him. Uh, before I do that, just some ground rules. May everyone please switch off their cameras just for the sake of recording. Uh, and then I will also do that when Dr. Risane starts to talk. Um, and then afterwards, you, we will we'll have time for question and answer later on, but we would love the, just the speaker view to be the one uh, that is, um, is actually being seen. Um, another thing is, please just save your questions. So the way that we're gonna work is, um, he's going to present for about 40 to 45 minutes, uh, his presentation, uh, after which I will then interact with him for clarification questions. And then after that, we are going to take a Q&A from the floor. So as you are listening, write down uh, some of the questions that you might have, uh, just to also uh, emphasize, <coughs> this is based on his book called South African Christian Experiences, which we will explain later how you can have a copy. Uh, it's really, really, uh, I, th I think it's worth the price that, that, that it's written on, it's worth the paper that it is written on. He will explain, why he named the book South African Christian Experiences, as I thought that was very interesting. But let me introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Resani, uh, and then I'm going to pray. Kilem Khile Thomas Resani resides in Johannesburg. He studied at Johannesburg Bible Institute. He got a diploma in biblical studies, Columbia Bible College, undergraduate diploma in biblical education. University of South Africa, a BA and a BTH, Northwest PGDE, and Pretoria, a BA, an honors in theology, a master's in theology, and a PhD in theology. For 31 years, he served in the Youth for Christ International. He has been a teaching and learning manager for the Faculty of Theology and Religion at the University of the Free State, 2014 to 2018. And he continues as a research fellow at the same university, researching broadly on the new apostolic reformation, Pentecostal theology and public theology in general. Rasani has authored three books, Mentoring, A Journey to the Best One, to the Best One Can Be. Another book is written, Communion, Ecclesiology in Racially Polarized South Africa. The third one is South African Experiences from Colonialism to Democracy. He contributed chapters in four different books and has published 60 articles in international journals. He currently serves as the National Director of Bible League International South Africa. Dr. Rasan is married to Tebi and they have three grown up uh, children, uh, which uh, uh, if he has time, he can then uh, speak about that. At uh, this time, we are going to pray and um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Rasani to give us his presentation. Let us pray. 
Lord, I just want to thank you again, even as we have prayed before. Thank you for this opportunity you've given us um, as Christians, as ministers, as leaders to reflect upon God, the work amongst us, the work that has been done amongst us. The world is asking questions of Christianity, the culture and, and, and people who are outside the faith and even many inside the faith are starting to question the Christian faith in light of socioeconomic challenges, in light of political challenges, in light of so many things, Lord, that we are facing, lockdown and all of that. And Father, you have raised your servant for such a time as this to be able to write such a work and to be able to explain our history for the purpose that, Lord, we might understand it, but that we may also hand over to a new generation, that we may preach a pure gospel. We may preach an unadulterated gospel. We may preach a genuine gospel. I pray that you will use him tonight to speak, O oh Father, what you have laid on his heart. Thank you for this opportunity to learn from him. Thank you for him availing himself uh, to us that he can teach us some of what we have given him. I pray for attentive ears and open hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Risani. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everybody from wherever. Uh, this is amazing to see that people can come together in different places, but speaking as if they are just sitting next to each other. As a matter of introduction, Africa has always been dubbed a dark continent. Hence the title of the book, South African Christian Experiences, is aiming to reveal how the imperialists and the local people through the missionaries were always at the local heads. People receive God and in a very different way. They realize that the God of the West is not the God that they were believing in before. And as a result, they ended up either rejecting this God or accepting him. At the beginning of the book, I say Africa has always been dubbed a dark continent, a continent in crisis or an uncivilized continent. And the southern part of this continent where most of us are living with South Africa, which is South Africa is where most of the contents of this book are based. The concept of God in Africa is diverse. And of course, but ultimately leads to one conclusion that there is a God. There is no doubt in African mind that there is a God. This God has always been deemed as the creator of the universe, the protector of human welfare, the ultimatum of human existence, and the apex of life. The African God is characterized with benevolence, sustaining power for protection and prosperity of the human race. The God of Africa is a God of life and life in its abundance. When you look at this book, it takes you that uh, you realize that it is written from Trinitarian point of view starting with God in the Christian understanding, God the Father, from there, the following chapter speaking of the Christology at the crossroads, which is God the Son. And from there, the issue of power, which is the Holy Spirit. And from there, it unfolds about the church and what the church is expected to do. What is important to realize is that Africans generally believe in God. They do not doubt the existence of God in this world. There is no doubt about it. Now, when we come back to South Africa where we are, I think uh, we can share some of the slides from here. There is this period, which is a very, very important period the overview 
This period is 1652 up to 1820. This time, South African colonial society was dominated by the people called settlers designating themselves by various names. Some of them, they used to call themselves colonists, inhabitants, Afrikaners, Christians, whites, or even Europeans. This population was composed of the Dutch, the Germans, the French, and the English, amongst others. They were, of course, from the different denominations, such as the Dutch Reform, Lutheran, and Anglican. One observes that the Dutch colonies arrived in the Cape with one thing in mind, a somatic norm image, a complex of physical characteristics which formed their norm and ideal of human appearance. When you read the great South African Christian historian, Gilumi, he speaks lengthily about this somatic norm, where there was a, a belief sort of saying everything that is white is superior. Therefore, even the God who was perceived as a white God was seen as the superior God. The so-called Dutch period, starting from this era, is the time of about 150 years where the Dutch Reformed Church growing as the only church permitted in the Cape. And the Christian faith spread from the Dutch community to the indigenous community, such as the Khoi Khoi people, and the imposed or imported slaves and the developing colored community. And when you look at this 150 years, you realize that Christianity was concentrated among the settlers and basically in the Cape. And as that time developed, they started to see things from the totally different perspective. And we realize that this time was the time when expansion started to happen. Then there came a period, if you go to slide number four, the period of 1815 to 1910. This is the time that is very, very painful. It's the time of expansion. It's the time of the, the British political control. And this time, started to cause many, many upheavals because you find the people who are originally the Boers, the Dutch, and then all of a sudden, the British come with some other nationalities from Europe and they start to plant some division, which comes by missionary expansion. It was the era of upsurge and resurgence of the missionary zeal in the next light. And amazingly, this is the time when the real expansion of Christianity happened. The English churches entered South African territory during this period. European and North American missions also arrived to establish themselves. Christian expansion and colonial endeavors started to work simultaneously. The British brought tribal tensions and wars expanded. And as we see, this led to some other great event that I can refer to a bit later. The racist theology marginalized indigenous population because God was like the European God. So the indigenous people were not supposed to be the of history. By the end of the era, Christianity was entrenched. This is around 1910. 
psychological suppression of African religions and spirituality escalated when Africans were started to be exposed to the fact that their belief system is a wrong system. And during this time, as Christianity was taking roots in South Africa, different mission agencies concentrated on ethnic or on tribal groups. And then I just want to apologize to my fellow South Africans who come from the Ndebele background because they are not included in this book. This was an omission that was not deliberate. We speak of different tribal groups, how they received the message of the gospel. Top on the list, the people that we come across are the Batwana people. If you go to the next slide. These are the people who were really the first recipients in what you call the, the frontiers. In other words, further away from the Cape. And they came across the message of the gospel during a very, very difficult time when the British or the Boer British tensions were so high that it finally led to what is known as the Kruat Trek from 1834 <clears throat> up to around about 1838. The Boers tracked from the Cape into the hinterlands. Then, we come to this tribe in the Northern uh, frontier, the area of Kimberley, Kuruman, uh, what we now know mostly as the Northern Cape. The first missionaries to arrive there were those from the British background, especially from Scotland, under the name London Missionary Society. And then they came across the first tribal group, which is the Batlapin of Ditago. Ditago is still existing up until today. It's one of the big villages in the northern part of the town of Kuruman. In 1801, they received the first missionaries. And this man was Jan Matei Skok. And because his gospel was so radical against the cultural practices of the people, the Batlapin people slayed him in 1806. But just later, a little bit later, there came another man called William Edwards, who together with Cork laid missions foundation in this place called Kuruman. And when you study how Christianity came among the Batswana people, it has four stages. And as we have realized, the main agency is the London Missionary Society. Stage number one is from 1812 to 1814, and of course, 1818 to 1881. The missionary who arrived was this man called John Campbell, who was accompanied by James Reed and William Anderson. And the three were operating in the territory between the Griqua town and the Ditakong, which is north of Kuruma. That was the first stage. It was such a great outreach. Then from 1821 to 1870, there arrived a man called Robert Moffat, the patriarchal preacher and the translator. And he joined Robert Hamilton there in Guruma. And he was interacting with this chief Mutibi of Batlapin. And uh, the two could not just go hand in hand because chief Mutibi has another agenda. And he even left the place uprooted by the Mzilikazi and also the, the, the Boers. That's when he left Kuruman to go to the Tago. However, Moffat decided to remain in Kuruman. 
And he became very, very unpopular with the local people, although they embraced him to a certain degree, he was not fully welcome because he was rebuking their morals and their cultural practices all the time. However, he continued to live there. And then we go to stage three, where from 1841 to 1852, there arrived a very well-known man, David Livingston, who was a medical doctor, a missionary and explorer among the Bakulube and the Bakwena people. This man became very popular with the local people because he gave them the medical assistance and also because he was the son-in-law of Robert Moffat. He played a very significant role in converting Chief Sichelo, the first of Bakwena, and exploring Africa. We know him to be the greatest explorer of that era than any other person. Then stage four, which is in the next slide, we see from 1860 to 1899, came a man that every church historian in South Africa will read about, especially among the Botswana people, John Mackenzie. He was a real missionary imperialist. And he was the last Scottish missionary among the Botswana towards the end of the 19th century. He arrived in Kuruman in 1860 and moved to Shoshone to work among the Bangwatu people. And he labored among them for 14 years, where with King Kama III, he built a huge church. This man was known for training teachers and ministers of the way. And in fact, if you want to know more about the indigenization of the gospel among the Batona people, you can't do that subject without reference to John Mackenzie. But there was a problem. He was the promoter of the Cape ideology of colonialism. He was preaching the gospel, indigenizing it as much as he could, but the Cape ideology of colonialism, the British colonialism, which finally led in 1885 to the formation of the BP, or what is known as Bichona Land Protectorate. This man, we can study a lot about him and will be amazed to see how he was really more of the center of what I'm trying to say in this book, that they came with two types of the gospel, the cross and the crown. So this is a little bit more about the Batona people, how they experience Christianity. Then we come to the next tribe, which is the Basutu people. Remember, among the Batwana people, London Missionary Society is the big role player. But coming to Basutu people, the next slide is different. Among the Batwana people, missionary went to them. But among the Basutu people, Kim Mushwesha, the founder of the nation of Basutu, is the one who initiated the calling of missionaries to his people. He invited missionaries to come and preach the gospel among his own people. Basoto were more receptive to the gospel than the Botswana as a result, because you know, in Africa, when the king has spoken, everybody will have to follow suit. And when you read the history of missions among the Basoto people, you are going to come across what you call PEMS. Paris Evangelical Missionary Society. Among the Botswana people, it was LMS, but among the Basutu people is PEMS. And most of these missionaries were coming from France, which is the reason why the Reformed Church in Lesotho up until today is called Gerekeafura, 
the church of the French or the France church. Because they came the missionaries such as Eugene Casalis, Thomas Abuze, Constant Gozeli, and so on. And these men were so well known. But look at the Christianity, how much you to experience it during that time when you go to the next slide. There are a few stages there. From 1833 to 1848. It is known as a golden age of missions advances. It's a very short period when you look at it, less than 20 years. But the mission was experienced the golden age during that time. And then from 1848 to 1854, there was a counter reaction to Christianity. If you know South African or Southern African history, you will remember what is called the Difakani, that abruption that was happening. There were some intertribal wars that were going on in the territory. And from after 1854, after 1848 rather, up to 1854, became a period of consolidation after there were a lot of disintegration. Almost the Basutu nation was decimated and the missionaries had to flee for their lives. And some of them even went to work among the Bahuruti people in the zirast area of the Northwest. But during this time of consolidation after 1854, the Catholics arrives, the Anglicans and the Methodists, and they started to challenge the dominance, the supremacy of Pems among the Basutu people. And realizing that they are just about to be annihilated or unseated by these new forces, Pems started to appear for help from London Missionary Society in the Cape. They didn't help them much, but anyhow, things started to happen differently. But the Basutu people experienced Christianity in a more wider scale. And uh, by those days, the whole thing of annexation was not yet in place. So it was difficult to know exactly how far is the Lesotho border. So missions were established in the places like Bethuli, Tabanchu, right through down to places of what you call Harip region of our day. And then leave Basutu a little bit and come to the Amakosa people. Now we move from the center of the subcontinent, we go towards the east. And this has a lot of drama in this place. Even there, there were some different phases that were happening from 1790 to 1820. It was just a simple encounter with foreign elements into traditional beliefs. In other words, the imperialists and the local people were there staying side by side without any gospel preaching. The two world views existed side by side with no dominance from any group. Things started to happen in 1820. Historians will remember that 1820 something dramatic happened in Europe. The Napoleon Wars that has forced a lot of people, especially from France. 1820 was the arrival of what we know as the, the French Huguenots. They arrived in South Africa and settled in the place called Grahamstown, which I think is called Makanda these days. From 1820 to 1860 is a period of conquest, of British settlement and the missionary expansion. When the French Huguenots arrived, the English people started to come into the place, but no more with the message of uh, extension of colonialism, but with the message of the gospel. The imperialists claim ownership of the land. 
unsettling the African tradition and sacred symbols, symbols as pagans, claiming Christianity as a norm. And this really caused a huge, a huge conflict. The Eastern frontier, there were more conflict than the Northern one among the Bajwana, even the Central one among the Basutu people. And we see that uh, coming to stage three from 1860 to 1910, Christian imperialism among the Amakosa people reach a summit of white dominance. The white people came into power to arrest or to do more of the dominance. The first missionary who arrived there in the next slide is the man called John T. van der Kemp from London Missionary Society. This man was an evangelical Christian. He emphasized conversion through grace. He was the, a Puritan, a very strong Calvinist who believed in the second birth, which is slightly different from the, the other missionaries like John Philip and the Methodists. But the emphasis for Van de Kemp was that people must experience God just as much as Europeans can experience it. He was followed by John Philip, who worked among the Kosa people through the London Missionary Society. And later on in the middle, the 15, 20 years period, Methodists like William Shaw also arrived. The Methodists preached the gospel to all races, though with patriotic alliance, with the British imperialism. And that really made like putting salt into the wound. Their message was the link between the cross and the crown, the gospel, and of course, Jesus, and I mean, the, the, the colonialist. There came some other small missionary societies later on, as time were, was unfolding in the next slide, the arrival of people like William Thompson, John Benny, John Ross of Glasgow from the missionary, so, uh, Glasgow Missionary Society. And the Moravians around 1823 arriving among the Tosa people, followed by J.L. Don, who opened the Berlin Missionary Society in 1836, and remember, this one was a Lutheran and he was German. And then, as the time goes on, because history will never stop making, there emerged some indigenous people. Some of them, we still celebrate them today as the, 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 the morning stars of the Christian experience in South Africa. Mwele, who in 1819 formed a military force to fight English forces who repossessed 23,000, sorry, it is not 2,300 days, 23,000 cattle of King Ndlambe. What happened here? The colonialists stole 23,000 cattle from the local key. And Mwele, as one of the head men, led the military force to fight against the English for doing this kind of fever. The other one that I know there's even a son that is so dedicated to him, Ntikana, a renowned singer and orator, known for interpreting missionary beliefs and practices in terms of his closer worldview. That's another prophet, as he's called, that those who are interested in, in the contextualization of the gospel or indigenization of the Christian faith, you can study this man and understand his worldview. Then there was a the man called Tio Soga, who was born in 1829 and died in 1871. 
He is the first black South African to be ordained as a Presbyterian minister, known for translating hymns and culture, and he was a cultural historian. Many of the Tosa Methodist hymns that we see today were translated by this man. So when you look at Amanda Batswana, London Missionary Society was the big agency. Amanda Batswana took PEMS, which is Paris Evangelical Missionary Society. But Amanda Batswana people, there were different forces, although London Missionary Society was at the forefront. And the Methodists became more powerful as time went on. And then they did not just stop there, they went up. Up the, up the coast to the north, where they came across the Amazulu people. When they arrived there, it was through the London Missionary Society led by this man called John Philip. John Philip is the morning star of the gospel among the Zulu speaking people. And he was followed by American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. You remember that there used to be a church called American Board, which uh, I think 30 or 40 years ago, they combined with the London Missionary Society to form what you call United Congregational Church. This is where they come from. Norwegian Missionary Society led by H.P.S. Kruder from the 1840s also arrived among the Zulu people. And this one went very closely with the Zulu royal house, especially with Dingan. And other small agencies came, the Berlin mission, which is one of the reasons why the Lutheran church is very strong among the Zulu people, followed by Hanoverian mission, the Anglican mission, and of course, which was led by John Colenso from 1855. There's no way you can study Christianity among the Zulu-speaking people without making a reference to John Colenso. He was a, a real reformer, a real revivalist. He's the one who brought education that comes through the missionary education among the Zulu-speaking people. And King Dingani of the Zulus permitted Alan F. Gardiner from the Royal Navy to embark on missionary operations in his territory. And later on, the Catholics also arrived. Together with two priests was this man called J.F. Allard. They embarked on evangelizing the Zulu-speaking people. You can see that our subcontinent, our current South African territory, experienced the gospel in different ways. But even here among the Zulu speaking people, there were a lot of tension. There were a lot of uh, kind of conflicts between the, the, the missionaries and the, and the cultural people, especially when coming to the issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, polygamy. There was a lot of wars that were going on. And then there was also an attempt to go to the Swazi people, Amaswat, up in the north. And when you look at these people, how Christianity came to them, the origin is so complex when you go to the next slide. Because the missions explorations were intertwined with the royal dictates. Only the king of the Swazis could invite the missionaries. If they came on their own, they were never welcome. The Berlin mission sent Reverend Merinsky and Grutzner on an exploratory mission to Swaziland in 1860, but they were refused permission to establish a mission. And later on, we see Reverend Joel Jackson Establishing a mission station in New Scotland on the Swazi border in 1871. The intention here was that the territory is in South Africa, but it's on the border, therefore, it can easily overflow, overflow into the Swazi territory. And from here, Jackson 
made constant contact with King Mbanzeni over a period of nine years. Apologies, apologies uh, Murodi. Can the person please mute themselves? You are disturbing the recording. Whoever is, uh, there's noise in the background, please mute yourself. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, sorry about that. All right, thank you. Thank you, beloved. You see, a larger presence of missionaries began in 1881 when members of the United Society arrived to establish the presence of the Church of England. This was the time when the Mas Amaswati people started to accept Christianity in the slower way. And then the Lutheran contact, when you go to the next slide, the Lutheran contact was made with the Swazi people living around Emelo from onward and became established in the country. Remember, these borders that we have now were not really fully established. So the missionary could see that, you know, maybe beyond the mountain is king of the Swazis who doesn't like us, but let's come this side of the mountain and try to establish a mission. In 1891, John Bailey, accompanied by Reverend Dudley Keat of South African General Mission, made an exploratory journey to Swaziland to visit the king and secure his permission to establish a mission station in Makajana. This was the beginning of the, 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 the routine of missions among the Amazonian people. And in July 1893, a group of four young missionaries from Scandinavian Alliance Mission began the construction of mission station at Bulunga on the Usutu River. Amazing. When you look at this, you'll realize that in every tribal area, the missionaries were received in different ways because it depended on the content of their gospel. Let's go up north from where we are to the Batonga people. Here, a very interesting development took place. You will find that the Batonga Christianity is inseparable from Swiss mission in South Africa, which gives you the reason why the Presbyterian church is so strong among the Batonga people followed by the Lutherans, of course, as we shall see. The Swiss missionaries first arrived in Lesotho and reached out to the Batsonga people of East and North of Transvaal and Mozambique. And of course, for them, the Swiss missionaries, the church and the school were the instruments or the method of evangelism to an extent that Already by 1879, the Swiss missions trained young teachers and they dispatched them to Moria in Lesotho. That is one part of the history that I always cry that we do not have much of it written for South Africans to learn that we as the indigenous people, we even play the role, positive one of course, being trained in order that we may become the teachers of our own people. By 1894, the New Testament was already published in the Isitonga language. 1899, the Bible school was inaugurated in Shiluvani near Zanin under the direction of uh, this Mr. Krups, Reverend Krups. Unfortunately, this college did not last long because there was an a, 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 a sort of an upsurge of the anglo boer War. And during this time, remember, the Batonga people were here in what we call South Africa in the northern part, Zanin area, but also across the border in, in Mozambique. Now that the borders are established, Mozambican territory become a Portuguese controlled territory they don't want the people in the Transvaal Republic to influence the people in Mozambique. So they cut that no Mozambicans must cross the mountains to go to South Africa because that interaction was not allowed. 
But fortunately, by 1907, the Tonga people received the Bible in their own language. Let's come to the Bavenda people. Very interesting history here, how they experienced Christianity. Among these people, in the next slide, Christianity was introduced by those of their own stock. These people, the Venda people moved from the north, went to Windwater's Rent and Northern Cape to work among the, uh, uh, in the mines. And they got and they heard the gospel there. Some of them went as far as British Natal. And after hearing the gospel there, because they were migrant laborers, they took it back home. So the history of Christianity among the Bavenda people is very interesting because it started with the people evangelizing themselves before the missionaries came in. In 1872, Carl Buster of Berlin Missionary Society established a mission station in Sibasa, which was followed by other mission stations in Chakuma and even in Elim. You can see the flow of Christianity among these people being done mostly by the local people. So the Berlin Missionary Society was followed by the Swiss missionaries, which is the reason why you find among the Bavenda people, the, the, the Lutheran church and the Presbyterian church is very strong than any other Christian uh, formation. What about, what about among the Babedi people? This is a very interesting part that you can also take a great interest in. From 1859, Alexander Merinsky and Henrik Gresner of the Lead Missionary Society settled in the place called Leidenberg, and they later moved to Hasikukun. It was in Hasikukuni where things were very bad because Kinsikukuni and the missionaries were not seeing eye to eye with each other. But the good news is that another sad history that we miss, the first Musutu foreign missionary, Isaiah Siele, was sent by Pems from Lesotho under the leadership of Padolfe Mabile, who is the French missionary, to go to work among the Babedi people. Please, if you are a good researcher, try to look for this missionary endeavors, the first Musoto foreign missionary to be sent from Lesotho to Babedi people. We miss a lot of details from that history. And in 1865, Narinsky left Hasikukuni after a lot of conflicts with Kinsikukuni, and he went to Middleburg where he established a Butsabelo mission station. If there is a, a deep sadness in South African history, it is this area, in the area of Middle Bank. People were forcefully removed there about 50 years ago. It is more like the place that some people are planning to return there. But that mission station was very, very strong. It became a convergence nerve of Berlin Mission Society in South Africa. When you go to the next slide. When you take a panoramic view of Babedi missions, it goes like this. From 1861, Berlin missions become the largest in the area. 1863, the Dutch Reform missions, sorry about the spelling there, Dutch Reform missions, led by Alexander McKeith and later by Stephanus Hofmeyer, came among the Babedi people. And Swiss missions, missionaries arrived in 1873, and in 1875, the Wesleyan missionaries followed. When you look at the Butabelo mission, at least for it, there's a lot that is written about them. There's a lot about what's happening on mission because it also influenced some nation station among the Batsona people in the place called Butsabelo, 
where also people were forcefully removed in, in 1970s in the area of Colini closer to Lechtenberg. And these two mission stations were run by the Lutherans and the church lost everything connected to those mission stations. So I have given you the overview of how different tribes received Christianity and how they experience it. But let's go a little bit deeper here and see how really they experience the effects of colonialism and apartheid on the African view of God. When Africans, after going all through this, missions and colonialism were comrades in arms subduing African and their culture. That is very, very unfortunate. For instance, Chief Mutibi of Batlapin vehemently resisted John Campbell for interfering with his Sitona culture and customs. It's there. It's there in history. Robert Moffat became unpopular because of his views about the Batsona morals. John Mackenzie, the missionary imperialist, sold out Batsona loyalty to the Cape government. Christian imperialism reached its zenith among the Amatosa people in 1860 to, 8, to, 19, sorry, to 1890. It all just revolved around the occupation of the Tosa land. That was a big conflict. The Methodists among the Amatosa people preached the gospel, though with patriotic alignment to the British imperialists. The European needs which came through the three C's, Christianity, commerce, and civilization were set above African humanness. That is an experience that has impacted Christianity in South Africa. The God of the colonialist is the God of discrimination. He is anti-African, he regards everything African barbaric. He is the God of oppression. He allows settlers to occupy territories belong to other people. He equips imperialists with gunpowder to annihilate the indigenous people. The colonialist God is the unsympathetic God. He is silent when Africans are being oppressed. His messengers are the true representatives of what he stands for. Therefore, he is the God who hates Africans since his messengers hate us. This happened particularly in the, among the Zulu people. You know, the Zulu people were very angry during that time that you know this God who robs us of our culture now is becoming like a big hoha over us. Let's go and realize that these people, even if they were bad, maybe with the ideology, there were some of them who stood for truth. For instance, John T. van der Kemp's dogma of personal conversion by God's grace and of course, equality of all people put him in conflict with both the Brits and the Blues. They didn't like him because he said, these people are also human beings that are created in the image of God. And therefore, the settlers, whether British or Blues, they didn't like him at all. David Livingstone's sympathy to the local cultures made him very, very uh, popular among the people, but unpopular among his own people. Robert Mission, I mean Robert Moffat, stood with the locals opposing the military and politically and the political means to settle disputes. I call him a theologian of dialogue. He believed in dialogue, that things must not be settled through the political wars or disputes. 
Paris Evangelical Missionary Society, missionaries to suit, stood side by side with Moshoshua in 1848 to 1854 during the times when there were a series of wars. And the same missionaries stood with him during the land disputes of 1843 to 1849. Some of them stood for the truth. Zimmerman of the Lutherans worked closely with Chief Muiro II of Bahuruzi against the Boers' inhumane treatment of Bahuruzi as laborers. And this will also be seen how the Lutheran missionaries in the Zeras areas used to accompany Chief Muiro to Pochistrum to the court where Chief Muiro was fighting against the Boer invasion of this territory. Some people will always say missionaries were bad. Yes, they were, but not all of them. When you go to the next slide, we realize that David Livingstone was horrified by some Africaners slaughtering Botswana people in 1852, justifying their actions by reading Deuteronomy 20, verse 10 to 14. I don't know how many of you know what that uh, passage says. It was a horrifying story when you read about it. Uh, let me read it for you so that you can maybe get a glimpse of it. In Deuteronomy 20, 10 to 14, they were reading this passage to say what you are doing is the right thing, it's a biblical thing. When you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be, shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. And you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. David Livingstone was horrified to see this event. It's a terrible thing and he, he couldn't understand how you use the scripture to justify the inhumane treatment of people. From the camp among the Kosa people, at age 59, married a 14-year-old Malagasy slave girl. And out of that union, four children were born and later on married a Khoisan woman. This was disgusting in the eyes of the imperialists. Not, I don't think the issue was because of the, the, the age difference or because of the minor and an adult. It was the issue of the race. How can we be a white man, a European, and marry a black person? And his successor, James Reed, also married a Khoisan woman and is reported to habitually had sexual relationship with another Khoisan woman. So this really made them to pull their hair left and right to say, what on earth is going on here? Johannes Benter of Berlin Missionary Society offered his daughter to marry a Babedi chief, Chief Kholukwi, to show that we are one, we are the one human race under the name of Christ. You can marry even my daughter. And Ewin Richard of American Zulu Mission had a continuous extramarital affair with a Zulu woman called Dalita Isaac. There's a lot of writings about Dalita's story which is very, very uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, pathetic because it's not a nice story because the, it was this woman who was punished rather than the, the man. And it was not like one night thing. It was a continuous thing. And uh, it was discovered on the Christmas day and uh, that really made the, the Americans mad about it. The God of apartheid. He's a white god of separationism, apartheid. He's a cruel god, merciless, and lacks a sense of empathy 
with the oppressed. I say this in page 54 of the book. And from page 53 and up to 55, I'm speaking about the God of white supremacy and normativity. The God who, uh, you know, just because you are white, you are better off than any other person. And therefore you don't even deserve God. The God of apartheid is the God who is not the God of the Bible. And we see that the God of the Bible has become the God of the European oppressors. The white missionaries disregarded or belittled African customs and traditional practices of Africans. They judge our attire, our music, our folklore and African etiquette as primitive. They made no effort to understand African rituals, idioms and cultural practices. These things are so full of spirituality that can bring us closer to God if we fully understand them. But they were regarded as pagan practices that must be thrown out. African communality, what we call Ubuntu, was displaced and replaced with individualism. Therefore, disregarding theological communion ecclesiology. And I'm uh, one of these uh, fanatic scholars when coming to communion ecclesiology, which is my specialization, the church. You know, when coming to the, the, the church, there shouldn't be any barriers at all. Societal structures were permeated with structural evils, dislodging God from society to individual heart. That is why there is a section in the book that speaks of, is there any salvation in the structural justice system as we find it in South Africa? The God of the Bible is the God who needs to be taken to the generation of young people. The young people who are living in the post-apartheid system the young people who have never experienced what many of us experience post 1994. Sometimes they are called the bone freeze. For them, Christianity is the instrument of oppression. They hear and read about apartheid and have never experienced it. And they come from all racial and social groups of South Africa. They are proudly South African, but with deep cries inside their being, looking for the purpose of life. They feel the vacuum that only God can feel in their lives. Unfortunately, they are the Bible ignorant generation because they attend the religionless schools. Therefore, I appeal to the church towards the end of this book that the church and the Bible must become relevant to this new generation. Yes, they read about what we experienced in the past as a nation, but we must be relevant to them. We must engage them. You know, there is this African saying that says, the generous must have seen, but must not have heard. Children must be seen, but not be heard. That era is past. For young people to sit on the pew in the church, they'll never become or feel part of it. We must engage them. And I conclude this book at the end by reciting that famous song that is sung probably to many of our churches, where I say Jesus is at the center of it all. Regardless of all these negative experiences we went through, Jesus still remained at the center. It's bad, it was not good, 
But at the end of the day, we have to go back. I've got this saying, I think it's in page 45 of the book at the bottom where I say, for evil to flourish in society, it only requires a good church to do nothing. When politicians destroy, theologians must build and bind. Silence in the face of oppression of humanity can never be justified. So, so far, so good. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm ready for you to fire me with questions. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rasani. Wow. I think we can listen to you the whole day. <laughs> we can just continue talking and we are, we are like sitting like a fire hose. You are just pouring, pouring water and wisdom and uh, so much history upon us that is, that is very much uh, needed. In my mind, I'm thinking this is the church history lesson nobody taught us. <laughs> these, yeah, are of the, course. <laughs> these are the things that have been there, but we seem to have only gotten one side of the story. I'm going to read something um, here, and then I'm going to ask you one or two questions, and then we're going to take questions from, from the chat. So if you have questions about something that you raised, um, historical questions, we'll get to uh, the practical questions of what this means for us today. Um, I'm going to read something here, which I also found interesting, and then I'm going to uh, sort of mix my question with what you said. You said the South African Black Theology coined a famous proverb. I quote, when the white man came to our country, he had the Bible, we Blacks had the land. The white man said to us, let us pray. After prayer, the white man had the land, and we had the Bible. Here's my question. In these uh, societies, LMS, BLS, PEM, as they are, they are coining, as they are dreaming about bringing the gospel to us, what is the relationship between the economic endeavors that they had and also the spiritual endeavors that they had? Because it seems as if it was not just spiritual, because when we think about the, the, the Bible being brought to us, and the gospel, we only think of it in terms of spiritual. But if I'm understanding you correctly, there seem to be other motivations that were there, were underlying as the gospel was brought to us. Can you maybe just speak on that? Yeah, it's unfortunate because most of them, they really had the commercial, uh, uh, I can say uh, aspirations. They didn't put it forward like we, do, we see it in our, some of our today's uh, Christian uh, uh, salliences. But they were more like, you know, as I spoke of three C's, Christianity, civilization, and commercialization. Yes. They were also the explorers because they will go into the indigenous virgin kind of tribal territory realizing that there's no so-called civilization there, then they'll call the imperialist to come. And sometimes it went the other way around, where the imperialists will go into the territory and realizing that these people are very wild, the best we can do is to bring the missionary for them. So commerce was part and parcel, in fact, I think I read in one book, I can't remember what it is, where they say that they became more richer than even the local royalties. I mean, if the man takes 23,000 cattle from one king, how do you expect him to be poor? He's making the local poor so that he can enrich himself. Mm. I don't know. I, yes, I don't thank know. you. Uh, sure. and, and there's a question here. How did, did they... Did these missionaries relate? Did they invite fellow Europeans or everyone just up and came here? And also, were they able to relate uh, to, to I'm, I'm assuming the question here, were they able to relate to our culture, uh, to things that were done? Um, how, 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 how was the interaction between them and the indigenous and local people? Tepo, maturity, do, do I note your hands, uh, will come to you. Thank you. 
Yeah, unfortunately, it was very tough, as I have mentioned from Robert Moffat, they didn't embrace or they did not even want to understand our cultures. They saw our cultures as primitive and pagan to be written off. I remember reading about Robert Moffat some time ago that, you know, for them, for you to become a Christian was to start to dress like a Western person. They did not want to learn deeper our cultural practice so that they can extract from them or to see how to apply the spiritual principles into our cultures. I mentioned to at the end there that, you know, for instance, Ubuntu was dislodged as a communal lifestyle of Africans, which is a biblical principle of not living for myself by living for another person where I must never be rich at the expense of the poor person. But they didn't do that, unfortunately. They became rich at the expense of the poor or even making those who are rich to be poorer. The land issue is going to continue to be a debate, especially in this part of the world. It's a ticking bomb. Mm. I mentioned the two uh, mission stations of Botsabelo in Middleburg and in Lachtenberg that you know, you look at those kinds of historical places, how the people were robbed of the land in order that mission may flourish. It's a ticking bomb. Unfortunately, one day it's going to explode and when it explodes, I don't know what's gonna happen. It's a fact. Okay, so, so there definitely seems like there was a relationship between some sort of the economics and also the spiritual aspect of, um, of, their, of their endeavors. I note all your hands. I'm going to take uh, some of the questions that are written first before we go, we go live. Uh, last question from me uh, before I, I, I then start uh, incorporating the questions. Before the missionaries came, um, Fundisi, around, I guess, the, the 18th and 19th century, um, did we have the gospel and, and how were we connecting to the issue of the gospel as the Southern people? We did not have the gospel, but we did have spirituality. Okay. Right from chapter one of the book, those working in darkness have seen the light. Yes. You see, we have the spirituality. We have the, the sense of the existence of God, but we did not have the message of the gospel as it is embodied in Jesus Christ. Instead of coming to give us that light, they went the other way to try to annihilate everything that we had. That is my cry in chapter one. Yes. The God of Africa is a God of life and life in its abundance. And therefore, Africans believed in God. The thing is that we, did, we, we wanted to hear more Many years ago, I went to Niger and I was trying to look for this uh, thing here. I couldn't find it. I think I put it in my uh, other extended family. They gave me a plate of different shapes of the cross mm. that existed in Niger long before the arrival of the missionaries. Yes. That there was the belief that there is this same cross and somebody died on this thing called cross. But as the, the, the ages were unfolding, this cross were made in different shapes. And you sit there in front of Nigerian theologian, they explain to you these crosses. You don't see anything else except the reality of the historic, historicity of Jesus Christ. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, there's, there's a lot of interest here in question, especially uh, when it comes obviously to the issue of apartheid. And obviously it relates to us here um, in the South as well. But the question here says, there's another question that says, do you think maybe the, the, what, what led to some of the oppressive practices was a misunderstanding of the Old Testament? In other words, maybe how much did a lack of um, maybe hermeneutics and proper um, interpretation of the Bible play in, in the oppressive nature um, of how missionaries actually um, applied the gospel to indigenous people. Uh, how much was there, because you read even Deuteronomy chapter 20, and obviously um, that was not read in context. How much did that play in, 
uh, not just apartheid, but I guess also with the colonial societies. Yes. Yeah, I think that the, the whole issue of the lack of hermeneutical uh, understanding of uh, you know when the evangelical movement raised up to become very strong in the 17th century, they embraced the literal interpretation interpretation of the scripture to an extent that they couldn't try to question anything. Mm. Take it as it is, it says this without any hermeneutical application of the context and what was the, it intended for and so on. So basically all these structures, even coming to apartheid itself, if you remember, scholars, African scholars were sent to Holland to go and study Yes. what you call the Hegelian uh, uh, theology of separation. And yes. they came back, they came back with all these texts like Genesis 11, that you know, what God has put together, let no man put us under. Yes. So you don't have to separate people when God has separated them. or don't have to unite people when God has separated them. Yes. And it was the whole issue of the, the hermeneutical misunderstanding of the Bible. And uh, remember, even up until today, unfortunately, or fortunately, yes. the Dutch Reformed Church still value the Old Testament as the, the Testament because of its kind of uh, Jewishness, because of its uh, centrality on one particular nation, forgetting the whole purpose of that God choosing a particular nation in order to reach the world. And they put themselves into the same boots that they are the chosen generation. Instead of becoming the, 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 the Egyptians, they become the Exodus people who have to leave the oppressive system of their homeland, which is Europe, to go into the dark continent to bring light there as a chosen generation. That's unfortunate. Sure. Uh, and I know the second part of the question was talking about how do we do that today? We'll come to the practical implications of what it means today. I just want us to, to just pass the, the historical questions, then we'll come to the practice. Here's an excellent question from the show. No, no. He's saying, has the dressing of God in a particular culture, um, has the fact that Christianity was dressed in a particular culture meant that the certain sins um, that are sort of exaggerated, but there's other scenes which are not necessarily, um, you know, made a big deal uh, because Christianity came in a, in a particular culture. Um, he talks about here, what sin can Christians honestly wrestle with and what sin should, should they be, and what sin should they be demonized to the point of excommunications of? And, and, and I see this quite a lot, especially with um, sometimes missionaries that have come here, you will you will hear people are very much angry against the sin of the unborn. Um, you know, it comes to uh, um, I forget what that is called. You know, when when the, the unborn uh, sort of like discussion and, and 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 many other moral issues. But but you you hear silence when it comes to certain other sins. Could it be because of the way that? Christianity was dressed that some some things are exaggerated, but some other things um, as the indigenous people look at it, they say, but no, this seems to be quite an, a big scene, a big a blind spot from from them, but but it doesn't seem to be put on the main mainstream. Exactly. They were very selective. And unfortunately, even today in our indigenous country of Christianity in our own land, we are we become very selective about sins. It's a human nature. Something that works good for me, even if it is bad, I don't regard it as bad. Yes. I'll accept it and use it for my own benefit. Yes. And then we have a lot of examples that we cannot go through into it as we speak of the commercialization of the gospel and the yes. extra biblical revelations that are really sweeping through our, our subcontinent at the moment. And then uh, what works for me is fine, it's not sinful. I even go all out to try to justify it as much as I can. And then uh, if it doesn't work for me, then it becomes sinful. It's because of the issue of sin, it's because of egoism. 
Yes. The gospel came to us in on a different platter. It was not a silver platter at all. Yes. For them, it was because they could gain commercially and maybe fame or otherwise. But for us, it left us destitute. It left us uh, robbed. It left us poorer instead of making us richer. So that is a it's a human problem more than the European or white problem. Right. All right. Um, and then there's a question here that says, how, how can we find relevance uh, of the pan-African vision in light of the divisions we embraced because of the influence uh, of our past? And so we realize the realities of the past, but now there's this pan-African vision that is put before us. How, how do you, um, I guess it's an issue of, of uh, how do we move forward? How do we look forward with the vision of pan-Africanism? When we are, when we are also have this baggage of colonialism, and um, also the way that missionaries brought the gospel. Yeah, I think that's a very valid question. Uh, <laughs> politically, I grew up as a Pan Africanist myself. Up yeah. until 1990, I had to change my views a little bit when the globalization was becoming a big thing. But religiously, I don't think I can apply it. Christianity must never, must never ever have boundaries. When coming to Christianity, you must have a Pan-African worldview. Africa belongs to all of us and we have to take the message of hope to all of Africa without any regard of these colonial boundaries. So that's my stance at the moment. I don't want to justify the fact that, you know, this was done in the past and therefore we cannot. I always tell people that we cannot put the barriers for the church. The church doesn't have barriers. The church is beyond the walls. It is beyond the borders. And therefore the church is Pan-African and is globalized. Define, for those who might not know, define Pan-Africanism. What do we mean when we talk about it? Pan-African is that all is for Africa and Africa for Africans and everybody who's not an African doesn't belong to the African ideology and African continent and African worldview. But it's beyond that. Pan-Africanism for me should go beyond the borders, the national borders. The promise that, uh, especially in South Africa, I remember that there was a time up until 19, 1994 when I was regarded as Mutsuana before I can become a South African. And that I'm a South African because I'm an African. And which is the other way around of the reality because I'm an African at the end of the day. And my white brothers don't like it when I say, when I appear in the scene, nobody will question my Africanness. Everybody, whether I'm in Budapest or I'm in the middle of the center of Europe, when I, just when I appear, people say, there comes an African. I don't have to explain myself. That's been African news. I am an African, whether people like it or not, by my appearance, even my worldviews. I don't, I don't like to use the national borders as the limitations for what I believe, especially because if I believe in the God who is the transcendent and also is, uh, is a God who is immanent, is above, as uh, the, the, the passage that you read earlier on, that is the God who is the tent, the tents and tabernacle among us is both among and above us at the same time. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I see those hands that are still there. Like I said, I wanna exhaust the questions that are written first. And then if your questions is still not answered, um, then you can put up your hand. So if those that have put up their hand can put them down. And if the question is still not answered, after we've gone through the written ones, you can put them up again. Uh, and Fundisi, when, when you also speak about uh, in your presentation and in your book, um, one of the criticisms you have for the way that the, the missionaries brought the gospel is that they undermine the, the cultures of individual people, uh, of indigenous people. And the, the question here says, how relevant or important is the African spirituality to the Christian? Because it seems from what I'm understanding, there's aspects of our, in, of our culture that, that, that were supposed to be embraced. But at the same time, there was aspects of our culture that obviously um, were not lining up with, with the word. So now, how, 
maybe to rephrase the question, how how should how, how should that how should that have been done in terms of you're bringing a gospel, but at the same time, as it confronts culture, there's stuff that is embraced, there's stuff that should be challenged, but there's stuff that should be embraced. As I mentioned over and over, they did not make any attempt to understand African spirituality. If right. they did, they could have really gleaned a lot out of our African spirituality and enhance it with the gospel. There are so many examples. Like these days, I write a lot about African proverbs, especially from my Setswana background, how these proverbs are so full of theological truths that I wish I could have been taught them when I was doing my formative training in theology, but I was taught the European theology and American theology more than the African spirituality. And then I discover a lot of truth in African expressions, African idioms, even African cultures, cultural practices, some of them. I believe that some of them could be discarded, but we cannot throw the baby with the bucket of water. There are some that we are supposed to be retaining rather than just throwing them out. Right, and I guess on another, um on another uh, platform and another uh, webinar, we might do a, a webinar on that to really double click on aspects of uh, African culture that should be embraced, celebrated, and other aspects that should be um, should be rejected. Here, there's a there's a question from a, a, a dear brother uh, who's who's uh, I know he's also a missionary here, and this is the reason why we have this is because we need to. To, to clear questions such as this, where it says, would it be accurate and fair to say that prior to the arrival of the gospel through missionaries, Africans in general, although they had concepts of God that were accurate, were ultimately idolaters who needed to repent of the worship of a false God or a false worship of the true God? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that question will always come. <laughs> exactly, it goes back to the previous, uh, just uh, the conversation we had that, yes, there were some idolatrous practices. Instead of throwing away everything, what are the good things that you could have learned out of those practices? Because definitely they were not ungodly, they were not 100% ungodly. There were some good things out of them. Instead of taking out the good things out of them and run with them, we just throw them all away. Yes. Therefore, African spirituality, African religion in its essence is not 100% idolatrous, it's not 100% pagan. There are some good things out of it. It's a fact. Right. So there's some, there's some um, good things, what theologians call uh, God's common grace out, exactly. of, out of the the practice of Africans, but then there's some things that also that also need to be challenged. Um, yes, there is a is a brilliant brilliant question here. It says how much contamination and corruption by colonial missionary enterprise to the current outlook of the church and its diversities are the lessons to learn from African indigenous churches? And I think we always look at um, the AIC churches. Um, you know, in the in, in the light of, of how the previous question was phrased, but other things that we can learn from African uh, independent churches. A lot. I think it's about two or three years ago I wrote an article on the the contribution of African Zionism to Christianity in South Africa. They teach us leadership principles. As an example, we have been brought up with a Eurocentric kind of leadership where a leader is above the people. Yes. But when you come to AIC, a leader is among the people. Yes. Read the story of a Mayor Christina Ungu, the founder of St. John's Apostolic Faith Mission. Yes. She never sat on the platform and she never had a special dress different from her congregates. Always white dress with the blue, a search on, sitting among the people. And when she was asked, she said, because I'm not a pastor, I'm not a bishop. They taught us, they teach us leadership Jesus style. 
a leader is among the people, not above the people. They teach us that ascetic practices of set from certain food is not bad. Many AICs don't believe in smoking. They don't believe in uh, taking alcohol. Is that not a lesson that we can learn as the mainland Christians from them? How about the pastoral care? They are the best when coming to pastoral care. That's true. Their member is admitted in the hospital on Thursday. They'll be there as a congregation, as small as they are in number, to go and pray for this person. They are the kind of the people who teach us that we can do things on our own. You know, the whole principle of Ujama, the, 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 the self-reliance. They don't receive money. They don't always cry for money from America or from Europe. They believe in doing things for themselves. The whole concept of Boto, Ubuntu, the whole concept of Litsima. African independent churches are very good in teaching us those things. Sure. Those are just three examples. Yeah, and there can be many more that, uh, that we can learn. Tomorrow is Women's Day, so I want to take a question uh, from a, a, a lady who, who, Utanda, who's saying, uh, thanks for the interesting question. How much has theological studies in South Africa changed to adopt a more Afrocentric approach as discussed tonight? This is an excellent question. So this now has, what are the implications on this, on the studies in terms of how- can, can you repeat the first part? I didn't catch the first part. How much has theological studies in terms of you know, all the theological institutions in South Africa, how much have they changed to adopt a, a more Afrocentric approach as discussed tonight? That's very good because uh, this is a battle. Uh, the, the institutions of learning are still speaking about decolonization of theology. And uh, being part of it myself, we are on the road to try to do that. Hence, Personally, I brought a lot of African concept and uh, trying to, to, to uh, sort of explain and uh, define theology from the African point of view. But let me tell you, it's not easy because our institutions are still dominated by Eurocentric kind of approach. A good theologian is when he studies Karl Barth, when he studies Chicken Boltman, when he studies Paul Tillich, or when he studies uh, Pannenberg and so on, you can go down the line. So, but the very little is done on the John Beatty. On our own grounds here, very little is done on Simon Maimela, Takato Mufukin, and uh, Maluleke, so lots of them. And they've got some very, very good theological contribution that they made to de a sort of uh, Africanize theology so that it become relevant to Africans. It's a long way to go. Mm. Uh, we go into the continent, we try to learn as South Africans. They haven't even gone very far there because they are also suffering, we were suffering decolonization of theology. Right. And that's why we have, uh, by the way, the Academy of Theology, which sure. is intentionally contextualized Christianity. So we wanna, we wanna um, add to the conversation of that. And I think more clearly that answers your question about how much contamination by colonial missionary enterprise has entered into the modern church. Obviously it is, it is a lot as I say, but um, there still needs to be a lot of work that is, uh, that is done uh, for that. Let me take uh, one or two live questions from some people whose hands are still up. Tepo, you can unmute yourself and then you can ask a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thank the organizer for this webinar. It's a long time I've not had uh, Muruti Resani Bratom, as we, we call him. Uh, this is Tepo who? Moremi. Okay. Oh, my goodness. All right. <laughs> yes. Uh, I would just like, oh, first question. I, I went to a place called Seville in Spain. Uh, and there you would find uh, a place called the Archives of Seville. 
Now you'd know very well about Pope uh, Contestina, uh, a Pope that has caused a lot of damage to many things. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that, that there's an agreement in Seville when under the Pope, the King of Portugal, Spain, and a representative of, of the King uh, from England, equally from France, when they divided the world into four continents uh, to colonize various parts of Africa. Uh, with the French supposed to go to North America, uh, the Spanish uh, to the South and so on, and Africa to be divided also. Would you say that uh, the missionaries that time had uh, clear intentions of what they are coming to do uh, in Africa, one among them, uh, the dispossession of land? That, that's my first question. But the second one, I would just like to follow up on the other question that was asked. Since we know the, all of these things and the injustices, and it's not that saying that we don't have good things that we have inherited also out of this, but uh, since we have so many injustices uh, done by Christianity, colonization, imperialism, like you have used them in the sentences, do you have any suggestions or recommendations in your book of how do we move uh, forward now, now that we have uh, this baggage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tepo. Okay, yeah, the first one is a very interesting one. Remember that they came from different missions, societies. But uh, when they arrived in a particular place, they always wanted to dominate that kind of a territory, just like uh, maybe the ascenders from Europe wanted to do to dominate different parts of the, of the globe. Let me give an example. When you go among the Batwana people, what is the biggest church? You will struggle to know that. But you go down south where the, the first encounter with the missionaries came. You have to be a congregationalist or you have to be an Anglican because of London Missionary Society. Then you go up to the areas in the old Southern Transvaal and the, a little bit of far north of the Cape. You have to be a Methodist. Then beyond the Eastern part of Malatika and right through up to Pretoria, you have to be a Lutheran. And in fact, there's even a book written, I forgot who's the one, about the Lutheran church in the Rustenburg area, where everybody was expected to become a Lutheran and they used to resist each other. If this territory of Zerast was occupied by the Lutheran missionaries, they didn't want the Methodists to come or the Presbyterians. Even I've got a book on my shelf called Bahuruzi, which is written about the Lutheran history and chief was struggle with the Christian faith. It was the whole thing that this is our territory. And there was even a Baptist missionary who came to Dinukana and the missionaries, while the, key, the chief allowed the missionary to operate, the Lutheran missionary said, no, he's a heretic. He can't be here. And he was there for three or six months and then he was asked to leave. So this kind of mentality was always there that you know, where the British go, the English missionaries must go. Where the French go, the French missionaries must go. You see that in Lesotho, how there was a tension between PEMS and LMS. And uh, how LMS was saying that you PEMS, you are uh, dominating the Basotho people. And they tried to come with a different agenda, but we found that the two of them are different because that the French missionaries were more amongst the people than the LMS. And finally, LMS lost the the, the, the hold. Then in the book, toward the end of the, of the book, from chapter eight, I'm asking this question. Is the status quo justified? South African Christianity and social cultural menaces. And then chapter 10, I say back to the drawing board, where I say 
let us engage the theology of dialogue, which is my specialization of research. Let it, let's bring dialogue back to the community. Let's talk about distance. How do we uh, undo the, 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 the kind of damages that were done in the past by the missionaries? And how do we really make Christianity credible amongst our people so that these questions that uh, we don't want to wipe religion can be dealt with? So dialogue is a powerful tool that can bring us closer to the reality to answer these questions. Thank this you. is how I can try to briefly answer these two questions. Thank you. I'll come to you, um, uh, Dr. Felix. Dr. Felix is uh, also a professor in Malawi. You want to acknowledge him here. I'm coming to you after this. Uh, uh, Muruti, there seems to be, and I get this a lot, especially when we talk about these topics, when people hear you talking and acknowledging um, you know, some of Africans and our indigenous practices, um, uh, maybe people get nervous and we understand because, yeah. you know, <laughs> Uh, you talk about syncretism and then mixing the two, they, they get nervous that look, look now they are trying to take us back to, the, to how we used to, to do things and worshiping of idols and stuff. So, so the, can you just clarify, especially for, for, for Tabang here, who, who's concluding that you are syncretist, syncretistic in your approach of the gospel? Um, <laughs> and do you think that your approach <clears throat> contaminates the very message that transforms the sinner? Because in his mind, your approach says, let us embrace everything, uh, whether wrong or right, African. Uh, and in his mind, you know, when that's, that's what you believe, that's what you're saying. And that obviously then contaminates the purity of the gospel. Can you address that? Yeah, uh, I think it's in chapter 10, where it says the church must stop being parochial. Uh, it's not syncretic, it's athletic. It's approach where I say, let us learn from each other let us see what good can I get out of you. It's not like embracing everything that is there, but it's more like, let me come closer to understand. Mm. I think that's where theology is. Remember, well, there are some still institutions that still speak of systematic theology. We speak of constructive theology, which means that my dogma is not just out of the Bible. My dogma, my doctrine, is enhanced by other spheres like sciences, philosophies, that I might be even uh, be regarded as pagan. I can get the truth out of them and then it enhances my belief in this God of the Bible. So it's not syncretic, it is athletic, it is constructive, well, constructivism as they say it. So <laughs> okay. I know okay. those yes. of us who are from the evangelical background and we are always scared of this kind of lesson right. that, you know, it right. means that we must go back to the old system and do things in the terrible way of a pagan way. It's not okay. true. Maybe, maybe let's, let's um, uh, maybe before I come to the next, let me acknowledge Dr. Felix. Uh, you can go ahead sir, and ask your question. Well, thank you so much. And uh, very great to see you, uh, Doc. I just read your work on uh, the New Apostolic Reformation, your thesis. When I was studying my mm -hmm. own, when I was doing my own thesis on uh, Malawi and your charismatics and apostolic office, so it's great to see you in the flesh. And yes, I seem you. to be following. Yeah, I seem to be following your footsteps because I've just finished uh, an article on uh, decolonial historiography for African churches, and I'm looking at the case of Malawi. Yeah, so I have I have uh, some some questions for you. Number one, who who are the South African? you know, silence voices, because usually coloniality and, you know, colonialism has a way of silencing some voices and, 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 and you know, centering on, on Europe more. And if that, it would be interesting for me to know who are those voices that, you know, we, we haven't heard, um, you know, theologians or teachers that really took a great part in the preaching of the gospel, because many times we're told Robert Moffat did this and, you know, David Livingstone did that. And yet, you know, they, they, they probably didn't know the language that well, and they were actually African workers that were doing the bulk of the work. So I wanted to find out from you uh, if, if there are any of those that you may know of. And then also, you know, what are the remnants, the vestiges of, uh, of this colonialism that, that, that's still there, you know, in the, in, in the South African church? I'm thinking here, 
of the more indigenous churches, maybe in terms of um, yeah, you know, the, those churches that have become independent, quote unquote, you know, are there remnants of, of that coloniality? And then what can be done to address that coloniality if, if it's still there? Yeah, those are my questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you very much. I think yeah, the I first one is on uh, South African uh, heroes. Okay. Independent churches, silent voices that are not acknowledged. And uh, we have the some of our leading scholars, they are really leading, but we we sideline them for some reasons that I still don't understand. I don't understand why we don't listen to Alan Busak. Why can't we listen? He's a Christologist. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, his theology is one of the pure theologies. I like to see people like Emaluleke, who is an international person, of course, but is he read enough on the South African turf? We just lost last year, I think, Vuyane uh, Venem, Presbyterian, Black Theologian. Do we understand what he's trying to say? I belong to this group of people called the circle, which is a little bit fun because it's a women's theologians uh, kind of uh, formation, but I'm part of it because I appreciate what they're doing. Our female theologians in South Africa, we don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. I'm speaking of the Professor Masenya, I'm speaking of uh, Kobo, uh, Hadebe, and there's quite a good number of them there out there who are really bringing, trying to bring us to understand that women are being sidelined, not only in theological circles, but in all spheres of life. Those are the silent people. Although they speak, we decide or we choose not to listen to them. And uh, African black theologians, who are out there, I don't want to say I want, I'm one of them, but uh, there's a host of people that we have decided not to listen to. Thank you. From African independent churches, galore. The remnants of colonialism yes. is very, very clear in the mainland Christianity. We still have mainland Christianity that is still under the dominance of the white people. They are at the forefront. They are dictating the polity of the church, especially this is the area which caused the, 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 the first breakaway group in 1800s of the Theosogas and so on. Mm. It was the, it was never an issue of doctrine on the issue of methodology. It was an issue of polity. When are you going to give Africans the time? Why do we have to have United Reformed Church and the Dutch Reformed Church at the same time? Mm. Is this not a sign of the colonial? They said the, a certain part of the church that is holding on to the colonial system that will finally end up having United Reformed Church and United Presbyterian Church, and while there's also an Evangelical Presbyterian Church. This is the sign that there's a colonial kind of mindset that is still in control of the church. And you look at this, one of the things that has killed Africans is this whole thing of bringing the, the, the regalia in the church, uniforms. I still don't know why the black Methodists have to put on red and white and black, why the white Methodists don't put it on. The Catholics, the, the Lutherans, Presbyterians, they like it. They belong to the same faith, same household, same confession, same liturgy. But when coming to Sunday, the others must put a certain a particular uniform to identify themselves. Why should I identify myself as a Methodist while I'm a Christian? 
and my white counterpart doesn't do that. Thank you. The music that we see, I see, I know that is taking a little bit of a change now, as yeah. I say in one of the papers that the, the African independent churches have really helped us to, to maintain and to, to, to promote the African type of music in the churches. If I can sit down and write a hymn, I'm going to write it in the Western style rather than African style. In Africa, we don't have verses and we don't have stanzas and choruses. But because of that influence, I'll sit down and say stanza number one, stanza number two. In the meantime, in Africa, we take four or five sentences and we send them over and over to form a rhythm so that our body can speak to the worship sure. where the whole body is involved. So, so, yeah. so those are some of the legacies, the leftovers of yeah. colonialism in the South African Christianity in the broader terms. There's a lot of them I can speak, music, folklore, liturgies, and so on. Because once you change the confession, you are in trouble. Mm -hmm. That is why we have Dutch Reformed Church. We still think that the La confession is communistic orientated. And when you ask them, where is it? Where is communism in this confession? They can show you. Just because we claim that if you are the children of God, you are under one Lord, one God, one faith, and we make one confession then you become communist. And if I won't join you to become united, I'll remain with my Dutch reform system. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, there's a common theme here uh, among some of the questions. Maybe let me try and, let me try and lump them uh, together um, in, in this kind of a, a way. Uh, Murut, mm -hmm. when you talk about embracing uh, or reading or, or reflecting or engaging with authors of black theology, African theology, um, um, th you know, theologies that are typically outside of, of evangelical, evangelical Christianity. The, a lot of people sort of think that you are embracing everything that those people uh, believe. Is it possible that we can be Christians, evangelical, Bible believing, and still appreciate and also um, reflect upon people of a different tradition. I still believe that strongly constructive approach. It doesn't mean that everything they say is correct just as much as I don't have a guarantee that everything I say is correct. I right. may stand on this confession and say that this is it. And somebody look at it and say, you know, you are really lost. So I take what is good out of any ideology or out of any system, as long as it enhances my belief system so that I can still remain and say, this is it. To embrace, I think uh, the, we've got a, a guy called uh, uh, Miroslav Wolf. He wrote the book called Embrace. To embrace doesn't mean that I'm 100% with you. It means that I, 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 I accept you as a human being. First, you are created in the image of God. Yeah. Whether I like it or not, you are the, the career of God's image. And then because you are a human being, I embrace you, I welcome you. Then I listen to your ideology or your belief system, and I see what I can take out of it in order that I may enhance my own system. And that is a, a problem that we call comparative theology that some people have a problem with where you compare and see what is right and what is wrong, but it's not that, but it's more like, let me understand. My positionality as a communion ecclesiologist is that I take the, 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 the attitude of Moses of seeing the Benny Bush and say, let me come closer and see, rather than standing at the distance and run away or uh, criticize, let me come closer and see. And then I believe that we've got conflicts in the world because we don't want to come closer to each other as human beings. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me take maturity, G. You can ask your question live. Um, my apologies. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can hear you. Yes, Felix, I can hear you. When they speak of you? from Malawi, I thought that is Felix, <laughs> <It's> Felix <laughs> from Nairobi. <laughs> this is Felix from Kenya. Sorry, um, I use my uh, 
uh, my Zoom link for my church Bible study. So I, I, I thought I'd already changed the designations there. Uh, but, but that's besides the point. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to uh, to the information thereafter, how I can get the book, because I'm groping in the dark, really. Um, even, even with the presentation, I've not read the book myself. Uh, but but uh, what I can basically say is uh, the um, presentation is wonderful. Um, the South African his, uh, history in terms of the Christianity, excellent. I, I think I've, I've learned a lot tonight and I'm looking forward to read the, reading the book uh, so that I can get more information. Uh, what actually stood out for me uh, were the three C's. Uh, the three C's that actually the missionaries came with, and uh, and when I look at the different formations that um, of the missionaries that came uh, to your nation, um, utter and total confusion. Uh, we are talking of uh, United Methodists. You are talking of the Reformed. So you are talking of the Baptists. You are talking of the all these and, and all of them are going to different areas of the African, um, that part of your world, and bringing different um, focus in terms of the understanding of the of the gospel, and hence hence a lot of clashes and and all that in my view uh, stems from now the the sending agency the sending agency there. Are, are the kingdoms, the kingdom, the mm. British kingdom, the, the Netherlands kingdom, the Spanish kingdom, French. the French kingdom, all those. And so they are coming with all that mentality um, to, to this newfound world, as they, they called it. Uh, so they want to bring civilization, they're bringing their culture, their influence uh, to this quote unquote dark continent. So hence, I mean, the pushback. Uh, when you uh, there's that pushback where now people are like, hey, if, if what do I you bring? Just, if I can just push you to a question, just because of time, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, my question is, because of that influence, then we have the influence now, all right? The with the globalization coming yes. in, we have the democracy now coming in, and such that now even the gospel itself. Uh, it's becoming um, a challenge in terms of um, uh, sharing it. Why? Uh, because of the influence that is there. We're talking of now various forms of influence, social media, yes. uh, the, the print media. So there's a, a lot of confusion. Mm. So such that even, and you had mentioned that aspect of now the, the prosperity gospel uh, going through Africa, uh, that's so the, the gospel, so what is the gospel? In my view, um, we need now to uh, tailor our gospel as African that will fit the, our, our context. Um, because when I look at the prayer of Jesus Christ, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth. So we contextualize that message to fit our context. Okay. Then, the, yes, so I mean, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, have you have you considered that kind of as that aspect of of view, uh, even in 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 what you're doing, sir? Um, because I'm I'm interested. I have a lot to say. I'll I'll I'll, I'll put an email together and send you some thoughts that I have. Yes. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, let thank me you. send you through the email. I think that yes. would be much better. All right. Thank you. Sure. Maybe to add on to his question, Funisi, and I think it's a very good question in terms of now looking at all this baggage we have from the past and all of the things that have happened, good and bad, as we look, as we say, to a, to a post-94 generation with no apartheid experience, you deal with it in the book, as we seek to preach the gospel faithfully, right, faithfully, as it was handed down by the apostles, as it was handed down by the faithful missionaries though though imperfect but some of them handed it down as we look to do that um how do we do that post 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 94 but with the existing structures of colonialism still intact okay i think the last chapter of the book answers that question very well theology in the democratic 
South Africa. The theology of reconciliation, where we need again, go to the previous chapter to invite dialogue onto the platform. If we don't talk to each other, we shall never understand each other. If we really want the gospel to be relevant to our society, we need to know each other. We need to know our audience. We need to know our context. The problem is that we have theologians who really disregard the context and therefore they come with the wrong hermeneutics. They come with the wrong message or the message is right, but it's not for that context at that particular time. The gospel become irrelevant to people because of that. And therefore we need to be the kind of the people who would still believe that the historical foundation is all where it went wrong, but we need as South Africans to come closer to bring reconciliation and through the dialogue to understand each other. That's my whole argument in theological uh, space at the moment. Okay. Um, there's some pushbacks I'm sensing from the comment section. Uh, which is good, uh, you know, it's good to engage. It means you are listening, but I, I hope as well that you are being fair to the speaker and not necessarily um, sort of like uh, concluding certain things because of that. That's why it's, it's only a two hour thing. That's why you must get the book. I hope some people have also read the book who are who are also uh, uh, making certain conclusion, but let's deal with this one. He's saying here, your message or your theology is clothed with Marxism and critical race theory. And the, the problem the person has here is that it's humanistic and it conflicts with the sovereignty of God. Would you say that's a fair criticism uh, of what you have said that you are, you are sort of like clothing it with Marxism? It's not fair at all. <laughs> Probably <laughs> that person does uh, not read the book. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, the people who think that way will read this, they will say that I'm too fundamentalistic, I'm too conservative, too evangelical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I think that like, he doesn't have the contact, the content of the book at all, because this book is written from the evangelical point of view more than anything else. The problem is that the uh, evangelicals we don't like to be challenged in our conservatism. We like to be, we are caught up in the parochial kind of system where we don't see outside the circle. Yes, that's a great point. And so, so be careful uh, uh, the brother to, to then just come uh, to those conclusions uh, that you're coming to. Just because somebody can write a book like this does not mean that they are less gospel or that they, they don't believe that the gospel is the only solution. Um, we've heard the man preach. He's a faithful preacher of the gospel. He pastors a gospel a center church. We we love, we love, we love his ministry. So, and also to the brother who who also keeps typing there and, and wanting some scriptural things. I would I would advise that you first read the book, uh, and then maybe we can have a more intelligent uh, conversation. Um, but let me take a question from Bishop uh, Muloy. Uh, if you can unmute yourself, you've been your hand has been up for some time. Uh, thank you so much. I was actually getting worried to say maybe you've forgotten about me. No, no, I was saying it. Uh, just we just want to give priority to the written questions. Yes. All right. Um, interesting input. Thank you so much. I'm a first time participant today, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, the question. Uh, well, I have a couple of them, but let me ask just these two. The first one is. Um, um, what is the difference between the Eurocentric theology, the Afrocentric theology, and the Judeo-Christian theology? Uh, the reason why I'm asking is because um, um, uh, Murudi is speaking mostly, you know, looking at the influence of the Eurocentric theology on Africa, but that is not the root of of the gospel is not the root of theology i think uh, eurocentricity has also borrowed it from judeo christianism now as a result of that um 
Is it is is African theology only impacted by Eurocentricity? As as I, I'm, I'm I'm picking up that he's trying to push that ideology, or is it that there are different aspects, there are different influences of uh, our African theology, and because you look, Eurocentric theology is coming from the coast, the coastal theology that came with ships and and all of those guys, but when you look at uh, coastal Myth, missiology and inland mythology, meaning that there were people who came from the Middle East inland into the African continent all the way to the south. And uh, we, we can use that one scripture reference in the book of Acts, whereby the missionary from Ethiopia came and received baptism and brought the gospel in that line. Is it fair or safe to assume that um, our, our, our influence, the African understanding of, of, of Christianity, faith in God, only came from a Eurocentric perspective and it came only through coastal mythology, mythology, or should we also consider that it could have also come from another, another point? I don't know if I'm making sense. Okay, uh, so there was a time, uh, there Okay, there was a time when I referred to the, the cross uh, symbols that I've seen in Niger. Uh, yes, there are those who came inland, but uh, those, uh, that kind of Christian influence from, especially from Egypt and Libya area, didn't really go down south into Sub-Saharan Africa until the Europeans came bringing it to us. So when you go to the, 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 the Horn of Africa, you look at the type of Christianity in Ethiopia particularly, you'll find that it's slightly different from what we do or what we have received that the people in Sub-Saharan Africa. It is very much close to Eastern, Middle East type of expression of Christianity which is the reason why in the, I think it was in the early eighties, there were some Ethiopians who really believe that they are the descendants of the Jewish people and they went to resettle in Israel. So that these two kinds, when you study Christianity in Africa, you are going to always hear of these two different forces. The one that came to us via Europe and the one that came to Africa, like this, the, the Ethiopian story that we are referring to in the book of, uh, of Acts chapter eight, and then uh, we always have to know that there are these two forces. And uh, you look at that, the differences are there, but they are not like a fundamental differences and to, to change our net narratives, but they are there. And uh, we received it in the way that it was brought to us because the Eurocentric uh, kind of uh, theology is more uh, Jewish based. It is more Judo, type of uh, Christianity or religion that came to them and then they brought it to us. Although they also tried to indigenize it. It's not everything that was from the Middle East that the Europeans accepted. They, they changed some things to in order that it may suit them. For instance, the whole issue of the empire and Christianity in Europe is not something that was coming from the East something that was uh, sort of uh, they embraced to see it as the best way of uh, facilitating the gospel among the different uh, Balkan states, especially in Western Europe. Then they brought it to us as it is. That is why uh, in some of the places, even here in the South, they thought that if you convert the king or the chief, then you have the whole tribe on your side. Mackenzie was very good at that. Remember, I spoke of Mackenzie, the imperialist, the missionary imperialist who influenced the, 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 the current Botswana so hugely that he thought that if he's got a King Kama the third on his side, or he's got King Sichele the first on his side, then all the Bakwenas and all the Bangladesh will automatically become Christians. They, because that's what they were doing in Europe. That was the system they used in Europe. So, it is a little bit uh, anthropocentric in such a way that they try to see what is the best 
tunnels. And we spoke of Swaziland, that in Swaziland, the Christianity was difficult to penetrate there. But the mere fact that if the king said, I don't want you, you are not wanted, you couldn't just go in. And they thought that if you win the king, you win the whole nation. So I think that's how far I can say it. I don't know whether I have answered it. It won't be satisfactory, but at least. Yeah, um, we have to move on. And I think that answers your question, uh, Christopher Tetsu, as well about um, how Africa, how much impact did the African church contribute to scatter the good news? Do you want to add anything on that um, in terms of the, the ill? Because it's also an important question, how the influence of the African church to, to scatter the good news. We always look at the European and the Reformation as the starting point of um, the spread of, uh, you know, uh, especially uh, evangelical Christianity. But not many people know that the African church actually had an influence uh, way, way before the, the 16th century. Do you want to say anything on that? I mentioned two examples that unfortunately, uh, Africans will suffer the, uh, the, 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 under the, the lack of recording. I mentioned two examples of the uh, Reverend Ciele from Lesotho sent to spread the gospel among the Babini people. We don't have much written about him. We don't have much written about how the Batsonga people through the Swiss mission worked so hard to produce the, the evangelists and the teachers and send them back to Lesotho to do the mission work. We really want to, to unearth those kind of people. They are the heroes, they are the unsung heroes. Fortunately, we have a little bit about uh, Ntikana, we've got a little bit about Tio Soga and the others, but I believe that there were so many out there and African church has played a very, very big role and their stories are not written. And then if we can put them together, they'll make an indelible mark to see how Africans moved. In our territory here, we know how people came to Johannesburg, Pretoria area, in, working in the mines and they received the gospel and they went back to their rural places. No more just as the migrant laborers, but as the evangelist. The, the Bavenda example is a very good one, but it's not only there, but all over South Africa. Many people came to the cities, received the gospel, and went back to their original places mm. to spread it where they come from. Mm. So African churches work hard in the evangelizing its own people, but it's not recorded as it's supposed to be. And then it's not only in South Africa, but they came here and they went back to places like Malawi, like Zimbabwe, and take, took the message of hope in those places. Yes. Uh, Zakel, I've noted your hand. The second part of uh, Chris's question was, how can we also be guilty um, as uh, African Christian theologians of repeating the very same things that our predecessors uh, did when they misapplied the Old Testament? Um, but also here, the question, there's a question here that seems to say, um, he says, it's not agreement with you because um, you know, the Bible is not open to feelings and culture. We're going to be no different than our predecessors. Um, I guess somehow he, he interprets what you're saying as you, you are sort of like embracing your feelings and culture and you are not uh, embracing the whole of the Bible. But a question, a positive question that can come out of that is how can we not um, repeat the mistakes of our predecessors as those who are Christians in this time trying to get the gospel across to a new generation? I think we need, we need to be very, very uh, conscious of how do we take the Bible to the people. What is the Bible? Wow. What is the message of the Bible? Is the message of the Bible to deliver the people from the oppression of the original sin, or is it the message of the uh, Soothing the people's consciences and minds so that they cannot think properly. Mm. It is very easy for us as Africans to use the Bible to oppress our own people, like the predecessors have done. Yes. We need to have our hermeneutics right. Yes. We need to take the Bible as the message of hope. Yes. We need to take the Bible as the message, as the, as the voice of God to the people, regardless of the cultural and because of their historical background. If we miss that, then we miss the whole purpose of the Bible. 
we become something else, we can send the wrong message to the people. Take example of what's happening around here. It's a, it's a little bit pathetic how the Bible is being used to enrich certain individuals. Yes. The Bible is being used. It has been used in the past to oppress the people or to justify the evil system. We don't have to, we have to be careful as Africans that we don't do the same. It's very easy, and we are doing it already in, to a certain degree in this kind of compartments that I'm referring to where commercialization of the gospel has become such a big menace in mm -hmm. our society at the moment. Thank you. I'll take a question from Zakele. Zakele, you I'm can muting myself. Mute yourself. Yes. yes. Thank you so much, uh, uh, host, <clears throat> doctor. Somebody um, kind of accused you of being syncretistic. I'm learning all these words. And then in your defense, you said, no, you are being eclectic. So my question is, does not being eclectic, um, is there no conflict with sola scripturia um, by the word of God alone? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. No, it's all a scripture. I embrace it as more than 100%. But what I say that for me to understand my belief system, I don't just have to be solar scripture. I must look beyond how the Bible is being experienced by other people who are, may not even be believers like myself. So what are the good things that I can get out of their belief system that can enhance my solar scripture. If I see a Muslim so dedicated to the Quran, why can I do the same about my Bible? If they can be so vocal about their prayer system, why can I learn from them that you know prayer is important in my life, that I must pray to my God, just like these people are doing more than they do. I don't even have to look at whether they are bring to the right God or not, but their dedication should teach me a lesson. Yes. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and also what I gather from, I think some of the responses, it, 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 it's also very in, insightful because um, I think uh, Muruti and, and even speaking to, to some others, we need to do another webinar where we talk about the gospel and culture because for some reason people confuse uh, certain aspects of culture. People don't realize how much enculturated they are, actually. <laughs> they don't realize that even the European and some of the solar uh, stuff, some of the stuff that has actually been brought as the gospel has actually been mixed with culture. And I think we are so blind to that that we actually think we are neutral to culture. Mm. But actually, there's a lot of things that are actually cultural in some of the stuff we do, and we're thinking it's solar scriptura. And I think it's some of the confusion that's here where people, when they hear African uh, indigenous things and theology, they seem to think they, they can't separate uh, certain aspects that is uh, African and certain aspects that is biblical. For some reason, mm -hmm. they just assume that you are somehow trying to go back and, and mix all of these things, which tells us that there's a lot of work and a lot of education that we need to do. And there's a lot of blind spots that we actually have embraced. And maybe as a last question, I think somebody sent this question to say what what aspects of um, what aspects of of our culture, like specific aspects of African culture, should we embrace, uh, and which one should we reject? Maybe if you can be specific on that. Well, we should uh, embrace anything that enhances the, the the human dignity, like Ubuntu principles and uh, things like uh, transparency. Uh, I think very soon there'll be a paper that I wrote on the poor power. You know, theology speaks the truth as it is. Speaking the truth, we should embrace poor power principle. Yes. Where poor power means, you know, it says it's one expression of saying that, you know, I say it as it is. Yes. I don't compromise. Yes. We say the truth as it is. Yes. We should embrace that. We should embrace the part of uh, Lobola yes. as the way of enhancing 
the relationship between the two families, which was the original intention, not for commercial kind of a transaction as it is done today. Yes, sir. We have to know that the gift is an exchange between the two families to say, you are me and I am you. So the two families you are becoming one. We should embrace or we should uh, maybe get rid of anything, any practice that undermine the human dignity. Things like uh, slaughtering uh, human beings to appease the ancestors if ever there's such a thing. Yes. Or even some cruelty that we do in environment as Africans yes. where we don't see that the environment is a gift of God. It's not something that we have to do as we like about it. We need to come to terms and get rid of any practice that is uh, sort of uh, uh, making the environment un uninhabitable for humanity. San sanitation is a good example. What about the purification of water? Yes. If the people come and just uh, pollute water, the pollute environment, that, that puts human life at risk. We must get yes. rid of those things and teach yes. people that we must embrace the good practices on those things to be good stewards of God's creation. What would be your advice to missionaries? And some of them on this call. <laughs> what would be your advice to them as they seek to, um, to bring the gospel this side? What would you say to them? Um, um, for this as a final call. Calm down, sit down with me. When I say me, I mean we, the people in the context. Ask me a question. Let me explain to you why we do certain things that you may think that they're wrong, only to find that there are good things out of them. Understand me, understand my culture before you condemn it. And this can only happen through dialogue. Let's sit around the table and let's teach each other. That's the bottom line. Sure. Um, last, lastly, I'll take an executive decision here and, and allow my wife to ask a question. She has a hand up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Bruce wife. <laughs> you can ask your question uh, since it's Women's Day tomorrow. Um. Hi, Doug. Um. I'm not sure if I'm confused. <laughs> mm. um, I, I, I really, I, honestly, it, for me, it's, I really want to understand. And that's why I feel like this is such a short discussion. Mm. And I wish I read your book because right now I'm really coming from minimal, minimal understanding. And I'm trying to put, and it's so exciting because, you know, um, the way you explain the history, most of the, in, well, most of it is really new on how the gospel came about and how the intention of how it was transformed to um, our continent, you know, it was really for personal gain and not really to glorify God and, and winning souls to Christ, the way I understand it. But then obviously the Lord used, used that, you know, to eventually, um, you know, um, reach most African with the gospel truth. I'm just trying to, to understand um, when you say, because I, I hear this, it keeps coming back when you say we need to learn from others, we need to learn from others, the whole contextualization and all of that. Um, we in, re with, in relation to the gospel itself, um, are, are we saying that as Christians, so what are you challenging us basically as Christians? Are you saying that we are not handling the gospel correctly. Um, we, yeah, are, are we not handling the gospel? And, 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 and when you say we're not, are you challenging that we are handling it based on our own experiences, based on our own understanding? In, so when you say, 
we need to learn, for example, from our Muslim brothers, um, which is good. I think it's good to, because the spirit of Ubuntu and all of that, that's, that's our Af Africanism. I mean, it's beautiful. And I think it should be encouraged and all of that. But is that the fundamental basis, though, of, of, of me as a Christian? Isn't my, my call and my goal to actually reach out to the Muslim brother and show them Christ that even though you are good at what you are doing, you, you're still not saved. You still need the Christ, you know? And at the same time, um, I hear you when you say we shouldn't check out what, they, the, what good they're doing, but as a Christian, it should be a reflection to my own personal walk as a child of God to say, am I really, really walking? Um, uh, am, I, am I really walking the talk as a Christian? Because I see right now as Christians, we are timid, you know, we do not share the gospel. We, we don't visit our brothers and sisters. We're not vulnerable to each other enough with our own sins. We don't confess. You know, we are legalistic. There's so many practices that we're doing that um, are not pointing people to Christ. When people say these are Christians, then it's like we're not really holding the flag of Jesus Christ properly. So I'm trying to to really get what 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 are you challenging me today about? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, basically, I say get out of the parochial mood. Yes. Get out of parochial mood. The gospel was presented to us in a way that is not very much uh, convincing to the people of today. But if we understand who we are and who this God is, we can do it better and we can make it acceptable to people. Come closer to people rather than throwing the stones from the distance. That's my take. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I think uh, probably a lot of people are confused about the, they might be confused about the title of the webinar. The title of the webinar is not necessarily discussing Sola uh, Sutura. Um, Dr. Rasani is a historical theologian and is reflecting on South African experiences, his book that is written. Um, so let's not be confused about um, what, what is the purpose of what we are you know, trying to, uh, to do here. But I need to, need to respect the time. We said half past eight. Uh, we're gonna, can we just pray now? Can we agree to pray? And then those who still have further questions, we're gonna stay on if, um, if Doc con uh, is... is, is um, is available and still continues maybe uh, for 10, 10 or so minutes, and then we will close. Um, but it's, we need to talk about the book and how you can get it, because a lot of you are asking questions, but not many of you have read the book. So I would really recommend us to really read the book. He's saying there are about 15 copies that are left. Read the book, reflect upon the book, and then have conclusions. It's, it's wise to always do that, to actually um, read something before you actually uh, have 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 thing. I, I've read it. I'm reading it uh, for the second time, and I I I think it's really really good in summarizing um, um, historical history of the the church in South Africa. So uh, is Bafana still on the call? I'm just going to hand over to him to close for us, and then those who want to continue can continue if you want more clarity. Uh, is ba Bafana is not here. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, um, Doc, maybe if you can explain how they can get the book. How, there's two ways that people can get the book. Um, maybe you can explain that, and then we'll um, we'll, we'll pray. Okay, uh, the books. Oh, yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> uh, I've got uh, 15 copies left with me, but otherwise. Uh, through Academy of Theology, we'll send some links where you can find, get the book at the University of Johannesburg. 
because the distributor, the publisher has moved from Bloom Content to Johannesburg now. But uh, if you want to get the book, uh, just send me a WhatsApp message, and then I give you the bank details. I send you to your nearest pep store. You must tell me your name, and then uh, where, what is the nearest pep store to you where you can pick it up? The book is five hundred rand, and then I'm not charging sending it to you a pep store. So just uh, take my number zero eight two four nine four eight seven one five. 082-494-8715. Sorry, one more time. 082. Yes. 494. Yes. 8715. Okay. Um, sorry, let me. You can get ebook too by the links that we shall receive. I hope. I don't know how shall we send those uh, links to people yes uh, so people can get in touch with us and then we can send them uh, those links from the academy of uh, theology side um i'm trying to to type it into the chat here um but you can send us a message on facebook uh, on the page academy of theology or you can send it directly to me or to bafana and then we'll make sure to get you the details of the doctor and then so that you can get the book so that you can you can really read it and, and benefit from it um but thank you so much um uh, doctor for for laboring uh, through this work i think a lot of people um make comments without actually appreciating something before they've actually read it you say in the book that this was a two-year work uh, in the making and we were there when you launched it, and uh, we've heard you preach. We've heard you, you know. Uh, I think you are you still part? You still part of? Is it AFM, right? Assemblies of God. Assemblies of God, um, gospel preaching minister. We really appreciate all the labor. Can we, with a round of applause, just thank um, thank U, U Doctor for for the presentation and for the labor that he's done? Can we just thank him? Um, can we just see those uh, claps there with your reactions? Just thanking him for the labor that is done for the for the book. You know, they say that people who are standing on the outside is easy to criticize and point fingers. Um, yeah. yeah, people who haven't done anything can just quickly criticize. But actually, to actually do something that's worth this discussion, this is good because it's so good that it actually generates a lot of questions at discussion. And that's how we grow as a nation, it's how we grow as Christians. When we begin to ask these uncomfortable questions, very uncomfortable for a lot of people to ask questions about their history and how that affects us today, uh, but it's necessary questions. And this is why we're here as Academy. We're not afraid of those questions. We want to be able to answer those questions because the gospel, the power of, of salvation, and to, the power of God unto salvation is able to even um, deal with those kinds of questions, even the history that has happened before us and what we seek to do. So I just wanna say um, thank you, thank you for your labor. You know, I hope people know now that we do have historical theologians. You don't always have uh, to quote Grudem, but we do have our own that have actually written sure. a Bible loving, uh, the demon chasing, God loving, Jesus Christ centered people that actually we can celebrate. And so um, I'm hoping that we can really, really um, uh, apply our minds with this. Let's apply our minds and really grow in this. So I'm going to pray. I see there's more questions. Uh, we'll continue to take those questions for those who want to continue. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, I just want to thank you for, for um, Dr. Resani. Thank you for his humility. Thank you for his love for the church. Thank you for his commitment to the Bible, <laughs> his love for Jesus. Thank you for his love for our people, uh, the African people. Lord, I thank you that when you saved us, it wasn't by coincidence, it wasn't by accident that you made us African. You made us with a dark skin. You made us love music. You made us, oh God, under the African sun. You, your word declares that you, you've put us in these places according to Acts um, so that we might grow up and that we might find you. So it's not by accident that we are who we are. Help us to understand ourselves better. Help us to understand you and your gospel deeper. Um, teach us how to do that with humility, Lord. Help us to, to not be so prideful, oh God, that we think that we know it all. 
uh, that we can't learn from others. Um, keep us humble and keep us centered on Jesus Christ, that whatever that we do, even in all of this, that it might be for your glory, it might be for people to ultimately get to know Jesus, people to ultimately come to you, because we know that this generation uh, is, 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 this is a stumbling block for them. They don't understand how can they serve a God who's colonial? How can they serve a God who's, who seems to be oppressive? But, but I thank you for giving that the wisdom to actually clarify, <coughs> them, not so that we can debate and fight, but so that we can actually learn the mistakes of the past and then learn how to communicate it better going forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.